From the 809 Restaurant and Lounge in the heart of Inwood, New York City, welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home in what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and today we are turning our spotlight on stand-up comedian and curator Kevin Barry. Kevin is a self-described narcoleptic comedian living in New York City. He has done stand-up all over the world. Locally in Inwood, he is the creator and curator of the weekly dope comedy show where you can catch the dopest comedians in the galaxy. Just wait and see. If you haven't attended, you should. It's every Saturday at 10 p.m., uh, particularly in pre-pandemic times. Uh, and po- in pandemic times, he is also the writer and creator of a new podcast called the Hellgate City Companion, which is described as a dystopian cyberpunk fantasy version of a prairie home companion. And I don't know what's more clear than that. <laughs> we are going to hear more about that and so much more. But first, Kevin, let me welcome you to In What Artworks On Air. Thanks for having me, Aaron. I uh, appreciate it. Sure thing, bud. Uh, it's great to see you. It really is great to see you in person. Um, and how are you faring, my friend? You're the pers- uh, <laughs> You're the first person... I've seen without a mask for it feels like about six years it's it's not that but it just it feels good but it's also a little it's more disorienting than yeah uh, than I thought it was gonna be yeah you're the, you, this, is, this is the first interview we've done without masks Wow that's yeah great this is the first one so I I, I, I I feel like a couple that's decided to not use a condom I I, I, think, I think that's part of the love we share it is now. <laughs> We're in it together. We're like it or not now. Uh, but seriously, though, it's been uh, uh, a long time coming, and we've been, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, the tides are turning. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll say I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Um, I feel the same way. Um, there, uh, uh, it's, we've, I think we've learned a lot, and I think it's good to take what we've been through with us to keep. <laughs> Perhaps the mask in our pocket for the time being, uh, yeah. but uh, and and be appropriate when that is appropriate to use the masks. And uh, uh, but I think it's it's nice to see that with the vaccinations and with uh, I guess the collective herd, not the immunity, the collective herd of people. Yeah. Uh, in New York City, our our near, which is our micro neighborhood of Inwood, Washington Heights, and the greater five boroughs, that we're all taking the right the right steps in the right direction to be functional again. It feels that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Cause I think it's important. I, I feel like this podcast is part documentary. Okay. And, uh, part, um, well, it's obviously it's the spotlight on, on your tremendous talent, but I, I think because of where we are, uh, COVID will always be a character in the room. And I think it's important to address that. It's like, you know, let's start at the beginning. Like, um, uh, you know, you've, you've, the, everything was wiped out in, in March of last year, mm-hmm. um, shut down. And, you know, you found, you held these comedy shows and it's like, not just your living, uh, situation of like yeah. your, your bread and butter job, your, your creative jobs too. So yeah, just take us back to where that were, like, how did you manage to navigate from March uh, starting out to now, even. I mean, I know we can, we'll get into the healthy campaign and everything else, but <laughs> yeah. you know, I think it's important to just uh, acknowledge it. Yeah. So it started out in a panic, yeah. right? Uh, I think it was on March 13th that it became widely shared news that we were in a official in an official pandemic, right? Right. Um, I remember I was doing show. I think the last show I did was on the tenth. I want to say, and it was at uh, I believe it was at Word Up Bookstore with um, with uh, with No Name, and I was jo- we were joking about washing hands. I had a you know I had a bit about that. I, I I remember everybody was on edge. We were we were all aware that the pandemic is real. Um, I, I, if I weren't back and looked at recordings from like open mics and shows, I was talking about, you know, China and stuff without any realization of how weaponized, uh, and, and really racialized and racist that, that whole topic would become. 
Um, and I continued to work my day job um, from home for the first time for, for a couple of months, for a few months. And then, then the bottom fell out there and I really didn't expect it. Like I was, I built a lot inside this company. I basically, you know, I have a independent video production company called Screaming Panda, which I ran for like six years before I had this uh, corporate job. And so I basically like built a video department in a, in a company, like an in-house. And, uh, and I just really thought I was like, well, not that I'm a linchpin, but just everything from the in studio uh, and doors and all this, getting all the gear and all this stuff. So it kind of, it kind of shocked me. Um, I continued to write comedy every, as like a habit every morning and write, which I think was extraordinarily helpful in keeping me grounded, uh, even if it tr just devolved into like blabber or, or <laughs> journaling or whatever. And for me, like one of the signals was, I mean, obviously, it was just psychologically very stressful for, for a lot of people. I had friends who died early on um, from, uh, I would say, adjacent causes. There was one guy, uh, one buddy who had cancer, who I had been like, oh, you know what, I'm going to visit him. And then, boom, um, it, it just like, it was like, oh, we started to have that feeling of like, sometimes you're putting things off because you're so busy, and then all of a sudden we weren't busy, and there's nothing I could do. You know, like, I had, for, finally I had time yeah. to go and see somebody. And, like, the world doesn't wait for you. Um, I had another friend who also, um, to this day, I don't actually know. I know he had um, a, something like COPD or a, a lung problem. He had always had it. Uh, and, and it was unclear if he took his own life uh, because he saw that this was going to be so bad and he was already a depressed, a depressive person. You know, and he was like, I don't, it's not clear, he could have, but like, th I both count them as, I don't know if they're on the register of, you know, the COVID deaths, but they were the two first ones that just like, hit me. Um, and the, yeah, the comedy community, like you said, I've played all over the world. I have, the biggest network I have is probably comedians. And um, it just runs the gamut. It's people from every walk of life, you know, from like, uh, unemployed, dudes living on their mom's couch to Wall Street bankers. Like every, every many people <laughs> think they could be a comedian. So um, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but that, that's kind of it, how it started out. And then it became more of a creative boon to me in, in some ways with Hellgate City Companion and, um, and my being pushed into really trying to figure out what I can squeeze out of this moss <laughs> yeah you know like can i can i squeeze sustenance out of out of this strange you know st whatever burden that's been placed upon us yeah and um and that has been one of the the bright spots that and the fact that my marriage didn't fall apart well i don't see how it could she's a wonderful woman she is but i do to a lot i think a lot of people well. it's been very stressful on relationships and Isolated people, you know, both have sure. been slammed. Sure, I didn't mean to make a slide of it. I, but, and, I, but, but she uh, is a wonderful woman. Just <laughs> <laughs> had to put it out there. She's listening. I know she is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, speaking of your creativity, thanks so much for being so honest, by the way, sure. in answering that, because um, I, th I think people need to hear that. <laughs> I think people need to recognize that and acknowledge that it's not been an, uh, an easy. Um, road to hoe so to speak and, and to walk and i think we're, we're yeah. all we're all finding our ways as i'm going to segue into the creativity in a second but i just like it's just because we're performers we're mm -hmm. um the, the people who are producing um lively uplifting hopefully joyful you think comedy you think smiles you think uplifting um it's a, it's a lot to get through to get to there <laughs> and, oh, uh, and 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 uh and so I just want to make sure I wanted to acknowledge that, you know, I wanted to acknowledge yes. that. And, uh, I wanted to go further back with your creativity though. Yeah. To, sure. to more, to more happy it did, times. It didn't start in 2020. It, so. No, it didn't. So, uh, let's start at the beginning if you would mind. Uh, so when did you get bitten by the bug to try comedy? Okay. And I guess to honor the question further is like, what gave you the confidence to pursue stand up? So it's kind of like mm. a one, two punch. Yeah. 
So I got into comedy. It's it's a peculiar it was a peculiar start, I guess, for me because I um I came out of college wanting to make movies and uh and now I understand how doe eyed and and some perspectives foolish that is how it's such a tiny industry and it's a it's a it's a very uh sensibly naive approach but Netflix and the explosion of, of so much streaming and YouTube it's it's really proved out <laughs> to be a career path for many and um I I started out I made a feature documentary uh called Shadow of a Bout um and that was really from the ashes of of uh, my film graduate school applications uh, it was one of the things I'd pitched um and I went from there to moving to New York, um, I made the documentary. Mark, I brought it to this independent film project, which was a, a market where you sell documentaries. Um, I even had an offer from a, an on, a streaming <clears throat> company. This was, right, this was right before Netflix, I think. And I was like, yeah, like anyone is going to watch documentaries on a computer. Thank you. I'll wait until a real distributor reaches out. Um, I will admit that I made the wrong call on that. Um, but I went from there to going back to film and uh, theater, actually. I was like writing screenplays. I was like, you know, I, I made a documentary. I wanted to make feature films. I made this because it was like what I could afford. And it was exciting. And it was a chance to learn uh, and practice storytelling. I learned how to edit videos and basically laid the groundwork for having uh, a way to, to pay my rent, which is really important, in, especially in New York. Um, I got into stand-up because I was <clears throat> I was writing. Uh, I wrote a play, and I knew it needed work. And I had gotten input from mentors and story experts and people who were like, "Look, take an acting class. If, if you want to write better dialogue, if you want to work on your the, the, the theatricality, the, the the drama of what you're creating, took an acting class." Um, I tried to take an improv class because that was one of it was like take acting improv. It was booked. Stand up class was open. I had been writing a lot of other stuff. Like I had been writing jokes. I've been exploring it just on a notepad. No, no performance stuff, but like been getting into um, Louis C.K. and uh, also the old whatever Richard Pryor and uh, Ronnie Dangerfield and. Sarah Silverman, a lot of comics that I liked, and I was just exploring the form kind of, I think, to write funny theater, you know, write funny uh, screenplays, and the stand-up class just clicked, man, I, I, I know it's, it might, might be a little bit cliche, but uh, I just, I got up there, I was doing the first jokes, I was like, holy cow, this is, this just dissolves um, all of the budget concerns, and all of the, the kind of <laughs> scenery, and all that crap down, and it distills it, you know, and it's like, it's just you and a microphone if you're lucky, um, and you don't have to worry about anything else. I think a lot of people are terrified of, one, public speaking, right? Uh, two, having everything hinge on you. Yeah. But as you can tell, I talk, <laughs> I talk too much already. <laughs> But yeah. that's why you're here, to put the spotlight on you. You're supposed to talk too much. Yeah. I, I mean, I later found out that comedy is not about just bloviating, but... It's about landing in yes. many ways. It's about where you stop talking. Right. <laughs> right. So that's... I, I don't... I hope that answers... That's a long-ass answer to your question, but if I could say it in a real nutshell, I, I wrote a play... I knew I needed to take an acting class or some kind of performance class, and the stand-up one was available, um, and it just clicked. And with that class, was, it, was there a, a performance outside of class that was like the coup de grace, like you performed like in a club or something like that, or at a, at a somebody's theater? Yeah. And that's what the, that was the moment, that, that was the place? Yeah, I mean that's that is actually the the genre of comedy classes that mm -hmm. they have they end with the class show. That, that's a yeah. 
What's that? The culmination of the class. Yeah, yeah. They, they all end with a class show that is a quote-unquote bringer, which is a, a term that has a has some negative connotations because you're you're trying to you know sensibly get people to buy tickets yeah. uh, to the show. So you're you're kind of a money maker for the promoter. But um, yes, I performed at Gotham Comedy Club. I had a, a very good set for my first big one in front of people. Which was not helpful, um, you know. Good means you can definitely go down. In the beginning, you, you, in the beginning, it's. I mean, too bad, I think, and then you never do it again, right? But like too good, and you don't match it for it could be years, because like you put so much effort bringing all these people out to see you, and it's probably not your best jokes, you know. The, the first five minutes that you wrote, like. <laughs> so um, it was good, and it was a good experience, and it didn't fully deflate my sales. But um, it was also a very difficult time for me. Um, my my mom had uh, I'd mentioned when we started this that um, actually in, in, in Inwood, I, my mom had visited me, and we had dinner at, at this uh, restaurant, um, eight oh nine, and um, then she had she got cancer. She got sick in the mid 2000s, um, and then she died, which was really uh, it sucks um, when, when your mom dies. It's uh, it's one of the things I, I learned, and I would never have pursued, I think, comedy or theater or, gone, start, or even you know started to push myself in this direction if I wasn't wrestling with something like that I think I, I don't know in some ways like it was like me put it this way when something like that happens like a, tra a, a genuine tragedy in your life uh, you'll see how people react to it and that I think tells us a lot about yourself and the people around you in my family um you know, I have an have older brother and older sister. They each play these roles. You know, you fall into a role. My, my brother in the dot-com boom, like, he could provide support um, and, and, like, help with financial things, and he was just in that position. My sister um, was just having a child herself, and she brought the uh, sort of ebullience of, like, a new baby and, like, life um, and, and connecting people. Um, I found that I was able to make people laugh. That's a great gift to contribute. In retrospect, it was, that was really the seed. You know, it wasn't just like I stumbled onto a comedy class. Like I think I was fully coming around to this notion. Like I made a, a documentary about an inner city youth boxing team in Chicago. Um, kind of a, a bad news bears meets raging bull sort of thing, but it's a documentary, right? Like those are, fictional movies so in real life it's sad it's tough inner city kids like it doesn't end on an up note right you know the the whole like racist underpinning of our medical system in uh in the united states was laid bare for me back then you know like 15 years ago like i you, i saw these things and i just felt way more hopeless about it because no one's talking about it but like there was a lot of humor in that documentary. You know, part of it was from me, part of it was from the kids and the coach being like, this is how we get through. Mm -hmm. there's, no more, there's nothing more funny than truth, right? Like the reality, the reality of the truth that you're in. It's like you, that's it. <laughs> if comedy is the tip of the iceberg, the other seven eighths of the iceberg is truth. And a lot of that's pain, mm -hmm. you know? And it's a way that we address it, acknowledge that it's here. It has the gravity, and how can we use that to like see the world differently and laugh, you know, yeah. at it? Well, you're a master, I have to say. If you haven't seen Kevin in performance or to his shows, um, he finds a way, wherever personal and or I'll say social pain that he sees in the world, uh, is able to channel it into a, a very strong set. And Thank you. Uh, you're quite welcome. And having a career in comedy 
is hard enough as it is. Yeah. Um, producing it, well, that's quite another challenge. Yeah. And um, one of the greatest qualities I want people to know about you that you possess is the genuine generosity and excitement to share opportunities with other people. And, and I'm, I'm going to say people, not comics, because I think I've been to your shows and seen a few virtuals as well. And um, it's not always only your, your regular, what you would describe as you're just a stand-up performer, it's what you do, uh, or a comic. These are people who are genuinely funny or have a incredibly interesting point of view on the world that is fascinating, mm -hmm. I think. And so what led you to creating something bigger than yourself outside of your own set? your own comedy show per se. I mean, it's what you said. It's the the desire to make something bigger than oneself, I think is that's uh, that's part of wanting to create a community. Uh and and to and to realize the potential that comes with people working together. Um e even even with stand up, which is considered one of the most kind of lonely pursuits from from the outside it is but i think that in the actual the way that the community functions um it probably gets lonelier as you go up the rungs maybe and you get the writing job or you get the the role and you're no longer hanging out as much maybe but i think even then there's th there's a lot of us there's, it, it's i think it's similar in any thriving uh, creative community especially now especially with the internet with with people with um, the potential to be on a, a chat with a group chat with people on just about any platform mm -hmm. um, you know it's not quite the same but like it sure as heck helps you know so like the green room ch chatting with the comics the hanging out the pal palling around before and after shows grabbing a pizza uh, grabbing a slice like running from open mic to open mic to show like all of that stuff is I, I'm not not to like over um, what's the word uh, over uh, um, hype it or anything. Being like, oh, it's just like it's a dream. The comedy community is amazing. Like, there's negativity and there's it's like anything else, um, and it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting funny. Like, there's all kinds of things that people are getting connection out of it. You know, in, in addition to just are you getting better? Um, but to me, I wanted to help people improve their craft. I, I think that that's as part of the journey uh, as an artist, like that's one of the, one of the things that adds meaning to your life as, is, as you start to feel mastery over what you're doing. And to do that, you have to build a place where it's conducive. I've been to many shows, many places where people didn't know kind of how to set things up, how to talk to the a crowd, how, how to talk to them like they're an actual audience who wants to be there as opposed to, as opposed to people who feel like uh, they're being ambushed um, or what have you. There's all, all these, all those pieces um, that the boil down it's it's empathy yeah I think we are I, I that's a really great note to, to highlight is that um, I being also with a theater background mm -hmm. um, I feel very much we're in the empathy business um, I mean when you say what business are you in it's like it's easy to say well I produce theater I produce stand-up comedy shows I produce musicals or whatever else like kick lines dance whatever it's like i th i feel particularly now but mm -hmm. um even 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 the, i'll say the past decade i think we're definitely in the empathy business uh and 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 creating that sense of community and i'm curious um why did you choose to do it in inwood well i okay so th the short answer is i live here that's the best answer because that's the way i did it <laughs> <laughs> i mean i want to walk to work man yeah look <laughs> Running around uh, New York City, and and when we say New York City, like we talk about it, like it's one city. It's it's, it's like it's a, small, it's a small international country. It's five countries. Yeah, every borough is like an entire city. In, in any other place in the world, like Staten Island, I mean, these places are huge. Brooklyn was considered an entire city in and of itself, I think, before it was considered a, a borough of New York. So it's really it's a disservice, I think, to the people here to. to that we keep referring to it as it's like it's a cohesive thing like it's but i mean but it, it is because because we will relate to each other in a way when we're on the train or when we're in the social it's connected the shared spaces it's connected 
but it, there are all these micro um, cosms and micro communities. And like, I think that like wanting to build something in your neighborhood, for one, it's not just because I live here. It wasn't here, you know? And I'm running around doing these things, going out into the, um, the, the uh, can I say ass? You just did. Okay, I'm going out to the ass end of Brooklyn, which that could be anywhere. That could be Coney Island, it could be East New York, but um, it all depends on, I don't know what the head, the head and tail part, but my point is that if places in Brooklyn that feel like there's not where, this, this isn't any better or, I could do better than this, I think, or, uh -huh. you know, I can do this. Right. Not even just I can, I can improve on this, I'm better. I'm just like, we could do this there's so many people, and in, Inwood has a good residential uh, concentration of people. People like me, people not like me, all this whole like spread. So that was, it was a challenge. And I'm extremely grateful to the, the community of people in Inwood who, who have come out and, and supported uh, Dope Comedy Show, um, in addition to the, all the comics that have hiked, you know, from everywhere in New York City, the, the two-year two train ride from Coney Island or whatever, these big guys who are like, I'm like, look, I feel bad because I see you're getting good enough that you're not going to come here next year, but it's still, to me, is, is a, a beautiful thing to be able to, to witness uh, and, and be a part of creating something, yeah. like you said, creating something that's bigger than uh, yourself. Oh, and you didn't stop creating it during the pandemic, too, so to bring it full circle here for a yeah. second, is that um, one of the great positive things that have returned in 2021 uh, is the dope comedy show via Zoom. And, yeah. uh, and hopefully soon again in person, as, uh, you know, as, as we, we, are, we keep the optimism flowing. Yes. Uh, and Fingers the and, smoking and, dope. And the park view or somewhere else can um, provide the space. Uh, so I just wanted to hear from you how... Um, how has the experience changed from the in-person experience pre-pandemic Parkview and over the other space too? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what, if anything, are you looking to incorporate from, like you're saying, like the virtual experience, the chatting, the, mm -hmm. the interaction uh, prior to in-person for the, the next iteration of dope comedy? You know, I'm going to be honest and say I haven't, I haven't 100% sorted it out um, as much as I can do that would bring, um, like, one of the things I loved about doing dope uh, on Zoom or on a virtual, on a streaming platform was we had regular attendees, uh, regular audience members from far flung places. We had a woman who would tune in from New Zealand, uh, and we had people from, you know, California, people who just, you know, in, there's no feasible way that they could ever be at the show, right? right? That's whatever I'm talking about as if that's a new thing. But it, it was for comedy this, you know, th this year. And it's, if there were, if there is a way to do a, a combined show, maybe it wouldn't be everyone, but if there was a way to do a show that would be live streamed, you know, for, for perhaps ticket purchasers or people who, um, I don't know. Maybe maybe you open the door. I, there might be some experiment experimentation there. The, the the trick is like, like if I can if you can increase the number of people who are seeing the show, it's great because you do you can increase the viability of doing it. You know, you can. Uh, I saw somebody saying uh, a theater producer saying like every Broadway show will be streamed now. Uh, maybe I'm misquoting him. Or maybe it will be recorded. It's up know. to the producer, but. It, that producer probably thinks every show he's going to do moving forward it, is streamed, probably. To be fair, right. Yeah. So, so maybe at his theater, at, at his, yeah. his uh, approach. So I think that some people are really trying to, are opening up to this. I think, like, for small independent venues and, and, and projects, like, what, what we worry about is, is uh, I don't want to dissuade people from being there in person because that is the, that's the heart of live theater, of, of live comedy as well. It's like, we haven't, the technology hasn't solved that, mm -hmm. you know? It's not like a phone conversation yet where you can hear the other person laugh at, at your joke in real time. Yeah. If, if it, I, I think that that's solvable in a way, like maybe not easily, maybe there'll be a lot of kinks, but that, that would certainly change the game. Um, 
if you could if you could hear people laughing in with almost no latency, no delay, you know, with a very slight delay, like it could really change comedy. It could also like it could also be a big hurdle for many people because you kind of a lot of show New York and, and a lot of comedy scenes you're they're like incubators, right? You, and I've heard people talk about this who are railing against cancel culture and who are afraid of being preyed upon by the by the the very judgmental masses. Um, we've had these places where you can go and kind of say stuff that you, you know it might be offend. You're trying to find the funny in it, and yeah, some people go too far and they're just offensive and they're not creative. But sometimes people. You know, you don't see how the sausage is made. You don't see the, the jokes that they're making. They're like, okay, that was wrong, but I'm in a place where people are like, fine, just keep going, man. We, we don't, we're not taking it personally. We know this is professional. Um, and that's, that realm, that kind of like protected environment is, is actually pretty important to get to good comedy. Like, it's hard, man. You got to make a lot of bad jokes that don't work, you know, um, to get to the ones that do. So... Having a place to fail, I guess, is like, I don't think that's necessarily um, the point where you have to get everybody streaming, watching you uh, bomb or whatever, you know, try new stuff. But there is, there's a place where I think that that could change it. Um, and hopefully with, hopefully, that's a big, that's a big thing, man. Because geography is, otherwise, we are, uh, um, uh, I don't want to say we're, we're slaves to our geography, but like we are beholden to each other's l laziness. <laughs> you know, who's going to show up? Yeah. You know, yeah. really? Yeah. How I, much does it cost? Yeah. And I, and I think there's a, I think it can share. I think the hyper locality can also make it that much more special yes. to share with the world. I mean, you, as you know, I've bet the farm on that. Yeah. Um, that's what my whole, it would always solve out. Yeah. Um, and, and I love that about it. Thanks. And uh, and I and I do think out of this great specificity for our local artists and mm -hmm. our and local thing, I think there's a universality in that. I yes. think I think people from outside. I think it just takes perhaps a little more technology. And by the way, some people on payroll would be nice uh, to help and help yeah. help make that happen because. You, like me, like many others, have kind of willed these programs into existence. Yeah. And um, <laughs> bombing at our own times, uh, doing the, you know, but that's, that's what it is. That there's a, a great amount of failure or else we would never find where we are. And I continue to fail on a daily basis, I must, yeah. I, I must say. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to be fair, this kind of bombing talk, it's like, look, everybody, I'm, Dave Chappelle, Richard Pryor, uh, Robin Williams, everybody bombs, okay? The only, the only comic that I've heard, other than Sinbad, who I'm not going to comment on, but like who said he never bombs is Bill Cosby. So I, I just, I think that, I don't know, I think it's bad. Um, I think it's, it's bad form to, to act like you're, you're in, um, especially as a comedian, to act like you're uh, invulnerable. I think there's ego. To, oh, there's yeah, obviously ego yeah. involved with that. But, um, but it's like, this this stuff that we do we we getting giving a platform to also other artists who who are extraordinarily talented is like it's a huge i i see it as a huge gift to the community and to people who are that involves people who are visiting not just people who live here it's it's a very international city we we would have people in the audience who are at an i don't know an airbnb from Liechtenstein, uh, you know, it, it's it's a very international um, crowd, you know, and, and New York is a city of 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 um, of, mi of migrants, yeah. <laughs> people um, people people uh, sojourners, people who've come here from other places. Right. For immigrants, we're all we're all from different places, and and we all share this transience uh, yes. of the city, um, and uh, it leads me kind of into. Um, your podcast, yes. Uh, so speaking of the city, <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, and, and all that, because I want to make sure we touch on it, because it's your newest baby, if you will. Yeah. Um, 
It's a podcast called The Hellgate City Companion. Yep. Uh, it's done in a style of a community radio show um, about an NYC-like town. Yes. If not NYC in a alternate dimension, perhaps. Indeed. Uh, but in a parallel dimension where Hellgate Bridge is a portal to other worlds, right? That's how it started out, anyway. Yes, that and, that's and, the uh, that that's the should I say that's the rumor, that's the urban legend, that that's what everyone believes. That's yes. what they believe so far. It's still being told. Yes. And it's still being discovered. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of um, I, I've I've listened to a lot of the episodes. I think okay. I picked like nine or ten. There's we're at nine now. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a lot of pandemic inspired imagery yes. in the first couple of episodes, I'll say. And I yeah. think you've got some freedom towards the middle and, and did some other things, which is great. Also, uh, so I'm curious to where, um, the long form story for the idea came from. Mm -hmm. And if you created this, not only as entertainment, but also as like a satiric coping mechanism for your listeners. Yes, that's a good way to put it. It it was a satirical coping uh, mechanism for my listeners and, and myself. I think in the way that I've been talking about comedy as a way as 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 one of the tools to navigate through stress and pain, um, to to comment on life. Um, what I've what's happened is. It started out as a, a desire to make something, uh, again, outside of myself, but separate from stand-up comedy. The, the ephemeral nature of stand-up comedy the, the, is, is part of what I love about it. Um, but I also, I haven't recorded a special yet, which is, I'm, I'm due and I, that's gonna happen, but not now. <laughs> and I've wanted some permanence. <laughs> I wanted to make a thing like I of performances, you know, I'd start out, I was writing a play and then I got into this and I got into stand up and it's a lot of writing, but like, sometimes it feels like my stand up act, like until you've, rec you've laid it down on an album or you, you've got a, uh, a, you're putting out a special, you, you don't have it, it is an impermanence to it. So that was one thing that certainly was just kind of a very basic drive to be like, this feels like a realistic pivot for me. I'll be talking, I can perform on a microphone, and I can maybe be someone else than try to be the character of Kevin Barry. Um, you know, that, that was a, a freeing element. And then, yes, it's, as a, as a one-two punch, it, it is a, a satirical look at what we're facing uh, in New York City, and, and I think also nationally, I guess, or, uh, as a people, with this pandemic, with the, with the insurrection, with this sort of big news attracting, frightening, uh, tumultuous events. And two, um, as a way to create an alternate universe, a, a place where possibilities open up, you know, even if they're gonna go into a, a realm of horror or a, a sci-fi um, exploration you know, of this character's uh, interdimensional existence. How, how the heck did I end up in this hellhole, uh, this sort of cyberpunk dystopia? Um, that to me was just really exciting and, and I have deep nerd roots, you know, in, in uh, Dungeons and Dragons and sci uh, reading sci-fi and growing up with uh, sci-fi television movies. So. That's always kind of been there. It's sometimes been in my comedy, but some jokes that have come out through the show that like I couldn't really, I didn't feel quite right doing them on stage, talking about demon possessed swords and um, you know some of that stuff. It was like I know this is a good bit. I you need the I, right audience for it. Yeah, right got to find the right place for yeah. it. And so there was some of that as well. Cool. Um, I, I do want to say that it's uh, you, you. You said it's the Hellgate City Companion. I call it. Hellgate City Companion, there's no the. I'm sorry, for the, I, I, I'm bad with indefinite articles apparently. It's fine, I should have corrected you in the very beginning, but I didn't want to be a jerk. Um, and, um, and also, y yes, the point you made about, um, it started out kind of looking at like our um, 
delusions that we like we have these mass delusions going on with with QAnon. Uh, I, I know I'm losing a lot of people here when I say that, but you know, cl uh, with people who are uh, massive groups of people who believe this like uh, conspiracy theories. That that was a term I was looking for. Mm -hmm. It's delusion, same thing. But which is not to say that there are certainly conspiracies. There are certain certainly closely held secrets by the government or by, you know by powerful people. Like, but these theories that that. They almost always verge towards some sort of anti-Semitic cabal, you know, evil, you know, thing. So it's like I wanted to also explore the horrors in a place like this and the kind of paranormal things. As is it, is it really that, or is it something else? You know, are, are should we be afraid that? Hillary Clinton is drinking the blood of children, which is a lie or something? Or should we be afraid that um, we lost, you know, two grandparents to a disease right now that's killing millions of people? Um, which is the, you know, what's going on right now? Like, it, it, so, so there's, I do think that, like, that question of, is it real? If it's not, what if it's worse? I mean, I, you know, there, th that's kind of, what are, we, what are we not seeing? And in a fictional world, I can go into very weird places for that because I don't have to worry about, like, now I'm going to tell you the real truth because it's, it's really the real truth for Hellgate City, for Neo Amsterdam. But, um, yeah, so that, being able to explore that and also not worry too much about um, stepping on people's toes or getting the truth wrong is very freeing and do you have a like end of season like story arc for yes. this or okay didn't yeah know was, i didn't know what your plans were because you ever ever evolving yeah so that that's like a really uh loaded question um not 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 in the asking of it but in the answering because i've been wrestling with this a lot you can say to be continued <laughs> yeah no it's no, it's a good question because I, I'm – so what's happened is I if, – if people – here's how I, I'm going to try to, like, boil this down. So if people just stumble onto the show and start listening to it uh, – and this is true of a lot of podcasts, I think, that launched in 2019, 2020. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you start out with a trajectory, and it's one of the few mediums where people are <laughs> finding their way as they go. There's some of these shows that have blown up. But it wasn't until like episode 26 that like people saw, oh, there's a meta narrative or something. Like, that's a lot of patience. And it's a lot of good execution along the way. But like, for my show, it starts out feeling like one thing. And it definitely feels like a, a bit of a parody of public radio in some respects. You mentioned the, you know, Prairie Home Companion. Um, there's some other shows out there that are the juggernauts, basically, of the um, sort of horror fiction uh, audio dramas that are somewhat similar, but I go down this cyberpunk alleyway um, and towards a narrative arc for the main character, the host and his fiance and his inner circle that culminates in a gripping serial story arc that will launch the second season. And the way I'm going to pitch it to you and, and I, the way I like to explain it as of today is episode nine, which is the one that just came out and uh, it's, it's the part one of a two part season finale is it functions like a prequel. Mm -hmm. So um, the show leading up to then is very much listening to Kirby Bevins do his radio show about Hellgate city. And I, I don't, dismiss it. I, I put a lot of work into it. I think it's funny. I think there are uh, great radio drama segments um, and, and, and a, a sort of vaudevillian mixture um, with a lot of co uh, commercial parodies. And um, I, I value that and it's important, but I was trying to steer the story through that and it was a little bit too much um, to, to have like a here's what happens in Kirby's life story, um, also sharing the space. So what's happened with Nine is you can, if you've never even listened to Hellgate City Companion, you can listen to episode nine um, and 10, 
because you'll, you'll need both of them. But you could listen to just nine, and then really, you, it's like getting a, um, I've never done steroids, but an injection uh, of, of uh, adrenaline. crank. Adrenaline. Yeah, Adre adrenaline. Adrenaline, that's a better, right? yeah, I don't know why I keep jumping to illegal drugs, but it's like, yeah, it's like getting just like a, a shot to the arm mm -hmm. uh, of adrenaline, and um, it'll give you a very clear sense of what the, the backstory is, what Kirby's trajectory is. And you can, you can do the first eight episodes and then nine, but if you're a little bit less patient and you kind of, you, you want to have that, um, what they call dramatic irony, where you, you kind of know, you know a little bit where this guy's going, he doesn't know, and that gives you uh, enjoyment, start with nine uh, as, as the prequel and then jump back. Um, and to answer your question, yes. And where can they find the Hellgate Companion? Hellgate Companion. <laughs> so uh, um, Hellgate City Companion is on uh, all of the podcast apps. Uh, you go to hellgatecity.com, and that will take you to the hosting site, which is Anchor, and then there has a list of all the platforms from uh, Apple to Overcast, you name it. It's on everything. So Hellgate City Companion, folks. Bookmark it. Yeah, hellgatecity.com, just three words. And Hellgate City is, is our name on all the social media, at Hellgate City, no spaces on Twitter, Instagram, everything. So it should be, you just have to know those three. You don't, even, you don't even have to remember the word companion. Just Hellgate, Hellgate City. City. Boom. And where can they follow you for your comedy? And for my comedy, the easiest thing now is to go to kevinplease.com. That um, is, uh, it has uh, links to all the, the things that I'm working on, my social media, uh, and so forth. And hopefully, um, I want to bring back Dope Comedy Show. Um, in, I'd like to bring it back in its former venue at, at the Parkview. You know, these things are, it's a business decision. And, and I'm grateful to have had the partnership that we've had uh, for the past, you know, five, six years. Um, and I, I hope to continue it. And if, if it doesn't work out there, um, or we have to pivot, I, I will certainly be keeping people posted on uh, on the social media. So definitely follow uh, both the dope dope comedy show and myself uh, to get the news as quickly as possible. Great. And uh, listeners, you'll be able to find. Uh, I'll put up links on that on the episode page of this podcast, so you'll be able to navigate all things that Kevin's up to. Uh, so, Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks uh, for having me. Uh, it's, it's really been uh, it's been delightful, and yeah, I. I I'm glad that you're doing this. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I and, appreciate and, that. and thank you for, for the house that you've built, uh, the, the Inwood Artworks. It's really a, um, it's a multifaceted wonder what you're doing, bringing film, bringing uh, performance, bringing really an, an, a whole, such a range, you know, from dancers to singers to comedians to theater performers to clowns to circus. It's like, it really, it injects this, this community with much needed art. And uh, I appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. I'll keep on keeping on. Same as you, buddy. You're, you're, you're doing great things here. Thanks, man. Um, so uh, thanks, Kevin, for joining me on this Artist Spotlight episode of In What Artworks On Air. And it's where we meet the musicians, the filmmakers, the writers, the circus performers, the artists of all stripes, stand-up comedians who make their home here in Upper Manhattan. Uh, if you have a moment right now, please show us some love and rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Uh, it really helps, and please share it with your friends. Uh, deep thanks to our host here at 809 Restaurant and Lounge uh, for all their support here in Inwood, NYC, for hosting us, and also to HeightSites.com for local uptown promotional support. Be sure to follow us on social media at Inwood Artworks to keep up with all that we do, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, pop-up art galleries, live performances, and so much more. You can support on air and all of our programming by making a tax-free donation at InwoodArtworks.nyc backslash donate. And this program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and in part by a grant from NYC and Company Foundation with partial support from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air.